capitalism has evolved over many centuries. Karl Marx, writing in volume one of Capital, wrote that capital or capitalism came into the world as an economic order, quote, dripping from head to foot from every pore with blood and dirt. Today, we will talk about the real story of capitalism. We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Welcome to The Real Story on the Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Gerald Horn. Dr. Horn holds the Moores Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's the author of many books, including The Dawning of the Apocalypse, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, Settler Colonialism, and Capitalism in the Long 16th Century. He is also the author of The Bittersweet Science, Racism, Racketeering, and the Political Economy of Boxing. Dr. Gerald Horn, welcome to the Socialist Program. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Horn, this week is Thanksgiving, celebrated by families all over the United States. People get a day off from work, perhaps a couple days off. Uh, Thanksgiving, of course, is part of the, the narrative one of the creation myth stories uh, presented by the U.S. government, the U.S. ruling class through all different mediums, including school, religious institutions, about how the, the settlers came from Europe. Pious Christians came to Europe and they had a hard time uh, getting used to the new environment. But the indigenous people in Massachusetts being generous, gregarious people, you know, help them survive, and they were all giving thanks. Uh, you know, because this is the socialist program, and we're coming at history from a Marxist point of view, from a from a point of view of historical materialism. I want to just start before I ask you to comment about this creation myth. Uh, I want to go to uh, something that Karl Marx wrote in 1859. It's the introduction to the critique of political economy. Very famous. Uh, important work written by Marx before he wrote Capital. He writes, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. Uh, very different from the way Christians or religious organizations present consciousness. For Christians in the Genesis, in the, in the Bible, in the beginning there was the word. And the word was good, the word of God. Anyway, let's talk about uh, creation myths, uh, how people understand history, and how social being rather than social consciousness actually determines how we think. Well, with regard to settler colonialism, there were different models. Recall that it was the people we now refer to as the Spanish who had a first mover's advantage since they sponsored Christopher Columbus in 1492. And yet here we are on this continent, uh, hundreds of years later, speaking English. A part of the philosophical idealism that has governed the ruling classes in North America and their acolytes has been a failure to interrogate that simple point. And if they did, they would revert to what you just made reference to, that say they'd revert to an analysis of religion. They'd look at the fact that the Protestant secession from the Roman Catholic Church, as we now call it, in 1517, spearheaded by Martin Luther, was then adopted by the monarch in London in the 1530s, supposedly because the church would not grant him a divorce, but I think it's fair to say that he, as his successors did so assiduously in coming years, also wanted to scoop up Catholic property, which they proceeded to do over the decades, which was part of the liftoff of this new system that we call capitalism. But 
there was a fundamental problem with regard to Protestant London challenging a Catholic Madrid for the feast in the Americas because there were not enough Protestants to go around. Catholic Spain, for example, the term we now use, with regard to settling Cuba in the 1500s, were willing to make Africans conquistadors if they profess the faith. Also, if you did not profess the faith, like Muslims who had ruled the Iberian Peninsula for hundreds of years before being uh, systematically ousted, culminating in 1492, or the Jewish population were systematically expelled post-1492. London, the Protestants, since there were not enough Protestants to go around, could not take that route. And so despite the fact that England had expelled its own Jewish community in the 13th century, uh, it proceeded to welcome Sephardim, that is to say Iberian Jewish folk, into the fold in London. And speaking of idealism, sus subsequent historians and analysts have suggested that this had everything to do with enlightenment. Suddenly they saw the light when actually it had more to do with material realities. That is to say, needing more warm bodies to confront the indigenous population of the Americas and keep the enslaved Africans in line, uh, which not only brings us to the 17th century and the Thanksgiving myth that you articulated, but somehow that Thanksgiving myth, which has to do with New England to the north, uh, does not deal with Virginia, where the invaders arrived in 1607. Whatever the case, uh, I think that uh, taking a materialist viewpoint uh, lays the groundwork for trying to unravel the current crises in which we find ourselves, in which we are now ensnared. And certainly, I'm also happy to say that there is considerable ferment right now in the United States ideologically with regard to contemplating the past. And we need an accurate assessment of the past in order to move forward. Just like if you go to a doctor, the doctor needs an adequate and accurate medical history before making a, a diagnosis and prescription. And it's not just the 1619 project of the New York Times, which has stirred up so much controversy. It's also the recent books by Woody Holton, for example, who is the son of a former governor of Virginia, the brother-in-law of Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, and his book, Liberty is Sweet, is a step forward in terms of the understanding of the formation of the United States of America, moving away from this idealism that sees abstract issues of liberty uh, somehow as, as driving uh, this revolt against British rule that leads to the formation of the United States of America. And I would also point to... Uh, some books, interestingly enough, that have not gotten sufficient publicity by Harvard law professors, of all things. Uh, Michael Klarman's book, The Founder's Coup, which points to the Constitution as, as a kind of coup, coup d'etat by uh, elite forces uh, in North America at the end of the 18th century. Uh, the new book by Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School, The Broken Constitution, which also has a sharp critique. Uh, of this founding document that has been bathed in idealism. And so this kind of ferment, which obviously has met a fierce counterattack and a fierce counterreaction in the form of laws uh, circumscribing what is called critical race theory, although most of the legislators would not know critical race theory if it smacked them in the face, the uh, backlash against CRT that helped uh, Glenn Youngkin a Trumpista into the governor's chair in Virginia in uh, recent days. And so right now, fortunately, the issue is joined. Uh, you have not only radicals speaking out more vigorously about these creation myths, you have even some liberals speaking out against these creation myths. And I think that that bodes well for the future. Yeah, I think that's so important. You know, when we, when we think about the trajectory of how history is being taught. And if we look just even at the last 30 years, the last 29 years, 
a remarkable shift has taken place. And I would have to say that you have played a very principal role in this sort of re-examination, rethinking about U.S. history. Because 29 years ago, there was the 500th anniversary of Columbus and Columbus arriving in the Western Hemisphere. And that was supposed to be, you know, something to celebrate. But instead, a social justice movements, social justice historians, meaning people who actually want to tell the truth, took issue with the official dominating narrative about Columbus and, and Columbus' arrival in the Western Hemisphere. And there was a struggle about how to remember. And at that time, you know, those of us who were demonstrating, say, on, you know, so-called Columbus Day, demanding that it be called Indigenous Peoples Day instead, we were few in number. Uh, those uh, who joined with indigenous communities in Massachusetts a month later on Thanksgiving to say, no, this is not something to give thanks for. This is a day of mourning for what happened, the, the genocide that followed with from the European invasion. When you think about what's actually happened in this very, very short period of history, there is a lot of progress. I mean, you know, it's kind of important that, that progressives especially, and of course, we're socialists, we're progressives of a, of a particular variety, that while we're paying attention to the here and now, where we see this right-wing racist revolt against so-called critical race theory, this effort to ban, to criminalize the teaching of American history, uh, that seems pretty bad. And it is pretty bad. There is this push and pull, as you mentioned. But when you look at the last 30 years, uh, a lot of progress. Go ahead. Well, certainly so. And I would be remiss if I neglected the gigantic leaps forward made in the historiography of Native Americans. Recall <laughs> that even... Uh, not so long ago, even those who consider themselves radical and Marxist routinely ignored Native American history and basically accepted uh, the founding myths. Uh, they might have put themselves on a particular side of the political spectrum, but they did not contemplate the taking of the land. And you would think for a Marxist, that would be fundamental. That is to say, who controls the territory? Who controls the land? And What's happened in recent decades, uh, starting with black studies, but then spreading to uh, Native American studies and Asian American studies, Latino studies, et cetera, Mexican American studies, is that that has helped to create a core of scholars who focus on this subject and they have forced the Native American question onto the agenda. Uh, I think of not only uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and uh, her book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, I'm thinking also of the recent documentary by the filmmaker of Haitian descent, speaking of Raoul Peck, Exterminate All the Brutes, which is a sweeping analysis come castigation of settler colonialism. Of course, the term settler colonialism also has forced its way onto center stage. Uh, that is to say, uh, not looking at the uh, migration of Europeans beginning in the 1500s into the Americas, uh, it's now seen as an invasion. It's now seen as a particular form of colonialism, and a form of colonialism that we now uh, use the descriptor, descriptor settler colonialism, uh, which means that the land and who controls the land has become a foremost question. Likewise, with regard to certain steps forward that have been made in, in labor history, I say certain steps forward because uh, I'm afraid to say that many of our labor historians are a little bit behind the curve. But eventually, I think that even labor historians will come to see the question of the enslaved population also as a question of class, in addition to being a question of race, also being a question of labor and helping to shed light on why and how it is that uh, hundreds of years after the first enslaved Africans arrived on these shores, you're still having elections, such as the uh, governor's race in Virginia, 
where attempting to demonize, marginalize, and otherwise defame the black population is still front and center. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, recall the uh, Willie Horton ad of George H.W. Bush uh, some decades ago that helped him to defeat Michael Dukakis uh, for president uh, circa 1988. Recall all the controversies about busing, which I'm afraid to say helped to propel the current U.S. president, Joseph R. Biden, into his Senate seat in the 1970s. Recall all of the demagogy about law and order, which was an essential core element of the so-called Southern strategy of Richard M. Nixon, circa 1968 going forward. All of these issues are seeking to use demagogy in order to defame and demonize the descendants of the enslaved population of which, of course, points to something that, too, is barging its way onto center stage, which is that it also exposes and reveals how the U.S. Civil War, 1861 to 1865, was resolved in an unsatisfactory manner. Uh, certainly, uh, we salute <coughs> the fact, at least I do, that the enslaved population uh, had their chains broken. Uh, but we also realized that there was no reparations to the descendants of the enslaved, uh, which put them uh, back, set them back in terms of competing in this capitalist economy. Not to mention the fact that with the defeat of the planter class, circa 1865, that set the stage for a further push to liquidate Native Americans, to further seize their land, et cetera. And these sorts of basic facts and truths are becoming the way that we are teaching U.S. history, and that is outraging many conservatives and even some liberals who prefer the old-time religion, but fortunately now the issue is joined, and I don't think that what I'm articulating will be going away anytime soon. It's, uh, it's critically important for everyone who cares about social justice, who's fighting against white supremacy, fighting against racism, fighting to tell the truth, to recognize that telling the truth isn't simply about study, even though the study is critically important, the scholarship critically important. Uh, if we look, uh, Gerald, at the way the U.S. Civil War was interpreted, I mean, the North won the Civil War. There was a wave of anti-racism that did sweep the country in northern states, even in the state of Maryland, where uh, Maryland Union soldiers who were voting in that referendum in 1864 about the issue of whether slavery would be abolished in the state of Maryland. Uh, the, the vote was going against the referendum to abolish slavery. And then the, the ballots came in from predominantly white soldiers, uh, or maybe exclusively white soldiers, I guess, at that time, uh, who were in the Deep South fighting shoulder to shoulder with enslaved or formerly enslaved people to liquidate the Confederacy. Uh, when you look at that sort of wave of anti-racism that came about as a consequence of a war, which for the enslaved people was a war of liberation, uh, and then there was, you know, the celebrations of John Brown all over northern cities for a while, for a while. And then as the northern capitalists abandoned Reconstruction, as they turned their back on the notion of black freedom, as they, in fact, formed common cause with the old planter class in the South, as apartheid became legal in the 1890s with Plessy, uh, the Plessy decision. Uh, the same time that we got Columbus Day, in fact. Uh, and then it was only in the 1930s where the Northern interpretation, the original Northern interpretation of the Civil War started to be taught again in New York City schools. And that was a consequence of the teachers union in New York City, largely led by the Communist Party or communist teachers who demanded that instead of the instead of telling the Southern side, the slave owner side of the Civil War, that the truth be told. I mean, when we look at all of these pushes and pulls about how we remember history, 
it's so critically connected to the struggle of social movements uh, where history and scholarship is tied to grassroots organizing. Well, that is certainly the case. And uh, speaking of the Civil War, I should mention at this point that it's difficult to understand the Confederate Army without understanding the origins of settler colonialism. What I mean is, as advocates of the South who seek to rationalize slavery, oftentimes suggest the Confederate Army was overwhelmingly comprised of non-slave owners. Now, of course, the apologists for slavery then use that to suggest that slavery was not at issue. But actually, what that exposes and reveals is this uh, vexing question of class collaboration. As I pointed out in my book on the 16th century, when you had the first settlers, invaders, arrive, from England in the 1580s and what is now Virginia, it was comprised, this invading force was comprised of a heterogeneous force of class elements. However, they were sponsored by the 1% and they were united on this premise that they could mutually benefit from pillaging and plundering the indigenous population and then uh, importing enslaved Africans to work for free. And so likewise, those uh, soldiers in the Confederate Army and Confederate Gray, they may not have been enslaved owners, but they ha had been imbued with the propaganda of the planter class. We all know, to revert to fundamentals, that the ruling ideas of any society are those of the ruling class. And just as many of those... <laughs> who fought in Iraq in, during the administration of George H.W. Bush or his son, George W. Bush, uh, they may not have had investments in oil companies. They may not have been able to point out Israel on a map, but they were imbued with the ideas of the ruling class, which is why they were fighting. And likewise, these Confederate soldiers not only were imbued with the ideas of the ruling class, but many of them thought that with some pluck and some luck, they too could become a slave owner. And therefore, that gave them further impetus in terms of, of fighting. And you mentioned John Brown, the great hero in, who in 1859, uh, with a hearty band, sought to lead an armed revolt against enslavement. In the first instance, in the western part of Virginia, but actually spreading throughout uh, the South, and unfortunately was captured and executed along with a number of his comrades. Well, it's interesting that John Brown probably receives more honors in Haiti than he does in Virginia. And there hangs a tale because we cannot begin to talk about the abolition of slavery without widening our scope to look beyond the narrow confines of North America and to recognize that the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, ignited a general crisis of the entire slave system that could only be resolved with this collapse. It helped to move London towards uh, abolishing the slave trade, uh, circa 1808, abolishing slavery decades before the United States in the 1830s. It even encouraged Mexico in 1829 under a president of African descent, Vincente Guerrero, uh, to uh, move towards abolishing slavery, which in turn uh, speaks to the territory from where I'm now sitting and speaking, that is to say Texas, because just as the settlers led by real estate speculator George Washington rebelled against London in 1776, because London seemed to be moving towards abolition of slavery, because London was putting restraints on the real estate speculators moving west, fighting Native Americans, taking their land, engaging in these grand real estate plays. Likewise, Texas came out of Mexico, seceded from Mexico with a similar motivation. It was a mini me, so to speak, of the United States of America, except on a more bloody basis, because what's interesting about Texas is that 
it was much more explicit about what it was doing uh, than the so-called founders uh, of the North American Republic. But what I mean is that the Texas settlers led by Sam Houston, Stephen F. Austin et al., they pursued a conscious policy of, quote, extermination, unquote, their word, not mine, of the indigenous population, which then cleared the land in their estimation, allowing for a massive importation of more enslaved Africans, which helps to explain why Texas has the largest black population in the United States of America, according to the 2020 census. And it also sheds light on why in the 1930s in Berlin, you had the budding fascists who were looking to the United States for tips on how to construct fascism, which is one of the reasons as well why we have to be on our guard going forward in this country with regard to beating back fascism. Because if you look at the history of the United States as these residents of Berlin, these leaders in Berlin could well instruct, you see all of the seeds of fascism, starting with extermination, for example, a conscious intentional policy, particularly directed at the Comanches, but also directed at the Kickapoo, the Caddo, the Tonkawa, the Karankawa, etc., who hardly are to be found right now, although they existed in the thousands, the tens of thousands, a mere 150 years ago. And then, of course, the slave labor camps, which were a hallmark of fascism in Europe, but were also a hallmark of North American capitalism. So history has a lot to tell us. It has a lot to instruct us. The only question is, will we heed history's lessons? Very, very important. I mean, when you think about Nazism, uh, it wasn't just Germany. It wasn't just Italy. It wasn't just Spain under Franco. I mean, by the time World War II starts, almost all of continental Europe is fascist. And this comes on the heels of a global capitalist economic crisis that began right here in New York City on Wall Street. This global system that colonized uh, and dominated other parts of the world using all kinds of techniques, either settler colonialism or other forms of colonialism that grew rich from colonialism, that grew rich from the enslavement of a huge part of the U.S. working class, kidnapped African people, got rich from the theft of the lands, the fertile lands of indigenous populations throughout the Americas. Uh, the same system was in a state of collapse, in a state of crisis, and its leading centers, including the British Empire, for which the sun never set up until that point, they were in crisis, and fascism became sort of the go-to method of stabilizing the system, but in fact, it destabilized the system, led to World War II, which in turn, which in turn uh, crystallized or catalyzed global revolutionary movements in all of what had been the colonized or semi-colonized parts of the world. So you had China and Vietnam and Korea and Indonesia and Asia. They, Asia was rising up, but so was the Middle East. So was Africa. Uh, the, this kind of dialect, because we're talking about a materialist interpretation of history where there's a cause and effect, but the effect becomes a cause that there's an internal contradictoriness of all things, but certainly of, of modern day capitalism as well, that there's this fight and there's not, a, I, I certainly don't promote the idea of inevitability. I promote the idea that uh, the fascists, the right wing, the racists could inevitably win unless the people fight back and find a way, in spite of all of the divisions amongst people, to find a way to form some front of, of unity. And there are some signs of that. But, Gerald, World War II was a, the interconnectedness of capitalist economic collapse and at the same time, uh, the tendency or the inevitability towards war. Today, we have hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people marching all 
over the world about environmental crisis, uh, rising sea levels, global warming. The, the prognostications show that if, if, if fossil fuels are, raised, are used at the same level they've been used in the last 20 years, the temperatures around the globe will increase by four degrees Celsius by, by the year 2100. And there's these mass movements that are growing. And, and the slogan right now is uproot the system. Well, that's a big difference from when Earth Day started in the early 1970s or when we had the so-called crying Indian ads promoted by, you know, again, by the ruling class where telling people don't litter. Now there's a recognition that it is the capitalist system. But when you talk about uprooting the system, of course, you have to replace it with something. Uh, uprooting the system means to uproot capitalism. I'm wondering what your thoughts are, because I know, and I've talked to you in the past about how, say, the struggle for uh, equality and freedom for black people in America became an international movement, and, and it had a profound impact on what happened in the United States. We're, we're sort of in that environment where everything has to be now approached on an international basis. But again, there will be differing trends between liberal, reformist, you know, sort of like tweak the system versus those who are growing in number who are saying uproot the system. Anyway, I want to get your thoughts on, on this topic because it seems it is at this moment an existential foundational question for all of humanity. Uh, again, the brunt is being borne mainly right now by those in the colonized or formerly colonized or semi-colonized parts of the world, but that won't be for long. Well, it's interesting that you mention the Glasgow meeting on the future of the planet, because there are some very intriguing trends, as you've articulated, that are emerging with regard to this uh, global movement that is marching under the banner of uprooting the status quo. And there is a growing recognition that the problem is the system. The problem is capitalism. The problem is this rapacious and bloody and endless search for profit. By way of contrast, what we have to keep our eye on is a contrasting trend that's emerging in the belly of this movement. Uh, what I'm referring to is, believe it or not, that there are those who are uh, proposing a kind of green imperialism. What I mean is that, for example, there's talk about extending the so-called res responsibility to protect principle to the forest, the rainforest of Gabon, or with regard to wildlife. Recall that RTP, Responsibility to Protect, was used demagogically about a decade ago in Libya by the Obama administration with the propaganda line put forward that the then Gaddafi regime was about to execute a massacre and that the international community had a responsibility to intervene to prevent that massacre. Now, RTP has been discredited to a certain extent, but like uh, Dracula emerging from the grave, it's now emerging in the context of this new movement to save the environment. That is to say <laughs> that the North Atlantic countries have a responsibility to protect the lungs of the planet. Uh, speaking of these rainforests of Gabon, or speaking of the wildlife in Africa, and therefore can intervene uh, to do so. I mean, this is something we're going to keep a very close eye on. Likewise, I think that many of the capitalist forces are coming to recognize, although they can't admit it to themselves, that when they cut this deal with China in the early 1970s on an anti-Soviet basis, uh, that is to say that the uh, Chinese Communist Party would fundamentally enlist with U.S. imperialism, wage this war in Vietnam after the United States is pushed out, et cetera, collaborates with U.S. imperialism, apartheid South Africa and Angola in the 1970s, but in return gets massive direct foreign investment. Entire manufacturing plants float across the Pacific, turning China into the factory floor of planet Earth, uh, leading to an virtual integration, not only of the economies of the United States, 
and China, but also to an extent, the, the North Atlantic countries in China as well. So now they, they want to get out of that deal. And so you have this new book by a so-called Pentagon intellectual, Elbridge Colby, The Strategy of Denial, which basically fundamentally uh, is proposing war, believe it or not, against the People's Republic of China. Res reviewed respectfully in the pages of the Washington Post just a few days ago. He's all over C-SPAN. Uh, speaking at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I thought they were for peace. Why are they entertaining this warmonger? Uh, other conservative think tanks like the Hudson Institute? It's a very serious proposal, made more serious by the fact that according to the new book by Washington Post journalist Bob Woodward and his colleague Robert Costa, peril that a mere nine months ago, and in order to declare a state of emergency, the 45th U.S. president was contemplating a strike, a military strike against China. This is uh, utterly serious. We can't take our eye off this question uh, because I don't think we can begin to talk about saving the planet <laughs> without talking about saving the planet from a nuclear holocaust, uh, which was, believe it or not, contemplated as recently as January 2021. And I think it's well for you to raise the question of fascism, not only because it's hot breath is now breathing down our necks, but also for the lessons that can be learned. Because it's not only that the fascists uh, were studying the lessons of dispossession in North America, studying anti-miscegenation laws in North America that they could then apply uh, in Europe. It's also that Hitler and the fascists, their idea was, that if the United States could commit genocide uh, over the decades and over the centuries, uh, moving westward, well, why couldn't Germany do the same, uh, moving eastward? And as you correctly state, uh, understandably, we, we focus on Berlin, but we also recognize that uh, the term quizzling does not come immediately from Berlin. It comes from Norway, uh, where you had collaborators. Uh, with the fascists, traitors, who sold out the nat national patrimony and fortunately were put on trial subsequently. And likewise, today in France, you have a presidential election emerging where one of the serious candidates, Eric Zemmour, is rewriting the history of fascism in France, suggesting that there was no uh, deportation or particular persecution of the Jewish population, even though he happens to be Jewish himself, and there is a lesson to be learned there. What I'm trying to suggest is to use a phrase that's oftentimes quoted in the U.S. press, but not necessarily in an edifying manner. The past is still with us. It's not even past. Indeed. And I think as we as we start to wrap up here, Dr. Horn, when we think about the the multiple and cascading crises facing humanity, you have global warming or let's call it global catastrophe. You have the very man-made catastrophe of a war between the United States or United States and its allies in NATO with the People's Republic of China. I mean, it's hard to believe that this is being contemplated, but it's not simply being contemplated. There is almost a consensus position that the U.S. has to ready itself for major power conflict. I mean, this all happened almost overnight without real debate, certainly not within Congress or within the media. Uh, we all learned that we have to hate and fear China just the way we had to hate and fear the Koreans or the Vietnamese or the Iraqis you know, to prepare the population for this inevitable conflict. So there too, uh, a, a huge crisis. I mean, if the U.S. could not defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, the idea that they could take on the People's Republic of China with 1.4 billion people and a vast economy and a strong military, I mean, the insanity of it is, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to actually describe that. And yet, it's been completely normalized. And at the same time, as you have pointed out, and I know I've talked with you about this in the past, 
in the face of these kind of crises, instead of dealing with the real solutions to the crises, meaning to uproot the system, to have a new system, to have a socialist system, a rational, humane system, where, where enterprises are under public control rather than a tiny clique of 1%, the, the capitalists get to make all the decisions about everything, all, all the things that are of consequence. Uh, at the same time, we see there is this rising trend of fascism in France, in Europe, and in the United States. And the reason I say this is when you think about all of the efforts to criminalize so-called critical race theory, which is just a criminalized telling the truth about um, the, 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 the actual history of the United States, uh, the criminalizing of dissent for people who are protesting against pipelines, including indigenous people. And then you think about what happened on January 6th, where tens of thousands of people aided by the most important and powerful people in the U.S. government tried to overturn the outcome of what they call a democratic election process, meaning the election process, and using force and violence. And now we have people, including, sadly, some, I'd say, idiots on the left who are minimizing uh, the actual danger of fascism. They'll say, well, some, a lot of those people were just along for the ride. And I think like, yeah, that might have been true about lynch parties too. There might have been some people who didn't bring the rope and the guns and the, and the, and the fire. They just were along for the ride. But it doesn't and shouldn't minimize what the mob means in American politics. The, the sort of the form of fascism in the United States. Anyway, it, as a final question, when you, when you look at these multiple cascading crises, the need for radical, far-reaching change, a new system, and at the same time, the danger of a, of a revived fascism, which is real. Uh, let's just talk about that in our last minute or two, where we, we, we tell our listeners or suggest to our listeners, what's the real situation? Let's tell the truth about it. And what can we do? Go ahead. Well, fortunately, there are some positive signs on the domestic front. For example, Business Week had a very intriguing article aimed at the investor class where they were comparing the performance of UPS, which has a unionized labor force, with FedEx, which does not. With this labor crunch that this country is now facing, a UPS, which pays its workers more handsomely than non-union FedEx, interestingly enough, is doing better. And so the message to the investor class was that you should invest in UPS and sell FedEx. Now, I think that what we should infer from that story is that we should double down on labor organizing uh, at Amazon and elsewhere and begin to, as we used to say some decades ago, withdraw enthusiasm from companies like FedEx. Likewise, I think in order to understand this current moment, it's very useful to mention two concepts. One is the concept of nostalgia, which you see with regard to Brexit, where many of the demagogic leaders led by Prime Minister Boris Johnson are trying to invoke the alleged glories of the past of the British Empire. And that was the rationale for pulling Britain out of the European Union, anti-immigrant sentiment, for example. It's now leading to very sharp clashes with the European Union, uh, which could spin out of control. Certainly these clashes in the channel between uh, the fishing fleets of France and Britain is utterly dangerous. And likewise, it's utterly dangerous, this ongoing uh, conflict between France and Britain. And you see this nostalgia in the same way in the United States of America. Uh, Make Mer America Great Again uh, somehow is designed for a significant percentage of the electorate, particularly the Euro-American segment, to look backwards, not articulating with any specificity the bad old days, but trying to have them engage in a march backward to the past, for example, not telling the true and accurate and adequate history of the, of the country, uh, 
but instead re reverting to the mythologies of the past. Uh, this is a clear and present danger as we speak. And another word is transition. Uh, the transition is taking many forms. It's not only the transition from fossil fuels to renewables, uh, which is, I would like to think, is in motion, and there will be a certain amount of bumpiness along the way. <clears throat> but also there's another transition. As U.S. imperialism, in its own words, tries to decouple from the Chinese economy, which inevitably leads to what are euphemistically called supply chain snarls. They're actually, <coughs> excuse me, political economy snarls. That is to say, you can't explain these ships lined up off the coast of Long Beach, Los Angeles, the major port, just by invoking the term supply chain snarl. What is happening is a political economy snarl, which as noted a moment or two ago, could eventuate in a catastrophe too ghoulish to contemplate. <clears throat> I should also mention in terms of uh, possible positive aspects is that even though the US ruling class is united on China, which is very dangerous, I'm not sure if I see the same unity with regard to Moscow, and that creates openings globally and domestically. The problem there is that the U.S. administration sends Lloyd Austin to Ukraine to make noises about Ukraine joining the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to beef up U.S. forces in the Black Sea, an adventurous slap in the face of Moscow. At the same time, that uh, CIA Director Bill Burns and State Department Victoria Nuland or dispatched to Moscow to make positive noises. Now, of course, the big enchilada in this whole charade is China, and they're disunited on whether or not they should seek to undermine Moscow in order to get an advantage over China, or woo Moscow in order to get an advantage over China. And so typically, the Biden administration being split, they're pursuing both courses of action, which leads not only to a certain incoherence, but also, I think it opens up opportunities, for example, opportunities that the Iranians could exploit with regard to the nuclear talks that are taking place in Vienna in November uh, 2021. So uh, this current moment, as the saying goes, uh, is imbued with both danger and opportunity. And I am confident that uh, our side, the progressive forces, uh, will be able to drive the engine of opportunity and steamroller the pestilence that is danger.